I cannot. <clears throat> the host needs to restart my video. Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody, this evening. It's been a long day, I know. You can just sit back, kick back and relax now. But before we start our dais and lecture session this evening, I'd like to welcome our colleagues. If any of them have managed to dial in from the ANZ conference in New Zealand, from which we just shared a fascinating talk on Maori ontology from Pauline Harris. So, keia ora tato kato a. I've got an announcement to make about the winner of the Dyson Prize for the best postgraduate presentation conference, which was our last session last night or Wednesday evening. I know that everybody who attended was really impressed by the research presented by all four contestants. Uh, consequently, it was a really hard decision for the judging panel because all four of our speakers' presentations were really excellent. Uh, but based on a set of agreed judging criteria, our winner this year is Samara Greenwood for her paper, How Context Shapes Science, a Tale of Two Papers. So congratulations to Samara. I'm not sure that she's with us this evening, but her check's in the mail. And uh, based, uh, but now, <coughs> sorry, for our main event this evening, which is the Diocesan Lecture, presented this year by... Professor Libby Roden. The title of Libby's lecture tonight is Soil in the Air. And just a little bit of background about Libby before we begin. Uh, Libby is a graduate of the HPS department established by Ding Dyson at Melbourne Uni. Uh, <coughs> and she has worked in universities and museums in Australia, Sweden, the UK, Germany, Denmark, and Estonia. She's published widely on the history of environmental science, including the book, The Environment, The History of the Idea, which is published by Johns Hopkins Press in 2018. And she now works as an independent scholar and curator at large, researching the role of science, humanities, and the creative arts in museums and in climate policy. And she was elected a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities in 2013. So welcome Libby. Libby, you're on mute. Technical issues. Can you hear me now? I can't hear you, so I've got no idea. Yes, we, we can. Fantastic. Be back. It is actually very exciting to be speaking to real people in a room, but it's very complicated doing hybrid things. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. That was mine. <laughs> okay, shall we begin? Is that okay for everyone? Positive affirmation in the chat. Good, thank you. I'm very excited to be here speaking to you from a real room with real people from unceded Wurundjeri lands and pay my respects to the elders of the Kulin Nation and to the elders of all the other unceded countries where you, my listeners, stand, including those in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The importance of cultural knowledge of country, of a deep sense of local place has never been more important than in our complex globalised world. I'll be returning to this theme throughout. Martin, you're going to have to fix the thing. It's gone to it. It's not letting me forward it with the. Um, we set it all up so we didn't have to do this. Thank you. It'll be okay now. Yeah. 
So the local is always somehow regarded as less important than the global. Tonight I want to argue, following philosopher Timothy Morton, that in, in fact the whole is smaller than the sum of the parts. But the parts together in all their diversity are much richer than any global whole. The planetary is signalled by NASA's images of the Earth from afar. But life on Earth is more an assemblage of ecosystems and villages. These interconnections between physics, biology and society happen at incredibly different scales. Together, they create a miracle that is diminished, even threatened, by the simplifications of the global. I want to talk about the sorts of knowledge that might help us support the miracle of life, not just the global economy. I hear echo the words of farmer and cultural critic Wendell Berry. What I stand for is what I stand on. The soil that grows your food is also your cultural grounding, he argues. But this will be diverse. Mary says, I speak for Henry County, Ten Kentucky, not even the whole state, let alone the world. The soil is where I begin in the 1940s, a time when Western nations united in efforts to plan for and reconstruct a world torn apart by war, uh, turned to the idea of world-mindedness and the role of science in society. Above all, efficiency was the way to manage a crisis. People pulled together, rationalising their limited resources. In our present pandemic times, I have been diving into the archives of an earlier crisis when soil was in the air. Literally, the dust storms of the dirty 30s were at the crux of many of the interconnections between economics, society, agricultural practice and ecology. Post-war reconstruction also drove the emergence of the university courses in the history of ideas, including history and philosophy of science. King Dyson, whose name is honoured by this annual lecture, was head of the first HPS department in the Southern Hemisphere and was highly influential in shaping the discipline. But as early as 1943, the medical faculty, where Ding worked as a demonstrator, introduced training in language and scientific method. The course was designed to remedy what she called deficiencies from which first-year students' preliminary tra training is usually found to suffer, including logic, philosophy and statistics. King Dyson's formal training was in physiology and biochemistry, interdisciplinary sciences with a human focus. She watched the compulsory generalist medical course flounder and by the early 50s began to lose its students. The arts faculty took a different approach with general science, a course established in 1947, designed to give humanities students an understanding of science. The courses for art students, eventually called HPS, expanded and built into a full major with postgraduate research options. Ying was a natural teacher, garnering pedagogical insights from eclectic sources. Her courses danced at the boundary between science and history reflecting medical education with a cultural context and pursuing ways to develop science for the public good. Edward Dyson, Ding's father, was also an academic, but rather accidentally so. He started off as a mining engineer, then became a stockbroker, and eventually found himself teaching economics at Melbourne University. Ding also had more orthodox academic leaders in her family, including Professor Ernest Scott in history, who was an uncle by marriage. He was influential in her broader education, but it was her father who imbued her with that sense of the international world and the value of knowledge that was useful to society. So this series of lectures is not the first Dyson lecture series. As it happens, her father was honoured similarly with his own lecture series in Australia's Economic Futures. Edward Dyson was a pioneer in the Economic Society of Australia and New Zealand, established in 1924. He also founded the Australian Institute of International Affairs in 1933. After his premature death in 1949, the AIIA lectures were renamed the Dyson Memorial Lectures. Speakers included Bertrand Russell, Julian Huxley and Arnold Toynbee. Edward Dyson instilled in Ding the value of international comparison in developing Australia's place in the world. She travelled abroad twice to teach herself about HPS. <coughs> in 1952-3, she went to both USA and Britain 
attending relevant lectures and seminars wherever she could, including those by Karl Popper at the London School of Economics. In her 1961 trip, she attended Thomas Kuhn's famous Oxford Conference lecture on the social context of science and became a strong advocate for understanding non-scientific factors in the development, evaluation and utilisation of scientific theory. It's nice to know that the Langham talk was about contexts and that Samara is here tonight, so thank you for being here. In 1954, Oxford philosopher of science Stephen Toulmin spent an exchange year at Melbourne Uni and took on the role of acting head of what was then called the History and Methods of Science Department. He reviewed its courses for the university, so it was that courses originally designed for art students were offered to science students as well. Pullman commented on the breadth and pioneering status of the department, but argued that it needed an expansion of staff, teaching and resources to achieve its aims. A prescient vision that the university never quite managed to support. The department was renamed HPS in 1957, but it was not until 1975 that the first chair of HPS at Melbourne was appointed. Rod Home, who's here also tonight, served in that role until his retirement in 2003. He strongly influenced the Australian Academy of Science through his long editorship of their journal, which became historical records of Australian science under his guidance. Context themes coming through, you can see. But after Rod Holmes' retirement, the Melbourne professorship fell vacant for 15 years. Only in 2018 was the chair filled by British Canadian psychologist Cordelia Fine. Here's Stephen Tallman. The impetus of the first, of first the war and then the post war reconstruction drafted many scientists into areas of practical importance in agriculture and industry. Food became coupled with security in this period and built on the earlier CSIR-led National and Empire Marketing Board uh, drive to feed the world through agricultural and pastoral exports. The Australasian Association of Scientific Workers, AASW, brought together scientists working on the home front to consider the question of what comes next was a conference in New South Wales, 1944. They wanted to formulate a policy on the organisation of science necessary to meet the demands of post-war Australia. The AASW set out to consider how the scientific method might improve the welfare of society. In particular, they recognised their ex existing international scientific networks and connections become valuable for post-war collaborations between different sciences and different nations. This was one of many initiatives at the time that created synergies between science and diplomacy. Building world-mindedness, as the United Nations called it, called on international collaboration. It also called for collaboration across disciplinary silos, particularly between economics and the natural sciences. While the work of what turned out to be the Manhattan Project made heroes of the physicists, the home front in Australia focused largely on the problems of agriculture and manufacturing industries that demanded industrial chemistry and engineering. In 1952, the Commonwealth had allocated 200,000 pounds, a huge amount of money in 1952, to the State Agriculture Department's extension services to enable farmers to receive quickly the authoritative findings of agricultural scientists so the farmers can apply the most advanced techniques in their farming operations. Collective cross-disciplinary enterprise demanded hard-won wisdom and considerable diplomacy. In the 1943 memo, Food, Agriculture and Government, David Rivett, CEO of CSIR, argued for scientific investigations and demonstrations of the latest developments in agriculture, some industrial regulation where necessary, and continuous study of the whole economic structure of the food growing enterprises from the standpoint of intra and extra Australian conditions, trade within the country and trade beyond. He argued that CSIR should lead the science, universities the demonstration of that science. The wartime Federal Department of Commerce and Agriculture should oversee the industry regulations, not the scientists or the demonstrators. 
this is what he said, the roles of scientific advisor and teacher require a special relationship with the people whose problems are under review, he noted, not enforcing government regulations. This division of labour had complex political implications, Rivet observed. It would be a duty of CSIR and the Department of Commerce and Agriculture to develop university act activity in agriculture to the full. That, however, brings one to a separate urgent problem, he said, of the relation between states, commonwealth and education institutions. With its wicked problem still echoes in today's pandemic politics, eight decades later, where relations between the states, the commonwealth, private industry and universities remain unresolved and problematic. Defending the soil was first and foremost a scientific task. Thus, science became a reserved occupation in the Second World War, unlike the first. Agriculture became further embedded in war duty through the rhetoric of such pamphlets as the Food Front. The food mission was an essential munitions requisite to enable the forces to finish the job, according to the leader, Banks Amory. Water has always been an issue in Australia. Early irrigation schemes were often not entirely satisfactory. Samuel Wadham, Professor of Agriculture at this university, argued in his History of Agriculture for the handbook for Melbourne Anzas in 1935. Wadham described Victoria's agricultural development as starting with exploitation, taking what was there already, then establishment, that's building fences and dams, and finally, in the 20th century, intensification, the rationalisation of land use to maximise production efficiency. Intensification was a task for real science. The fundamental mistake with early irrigation schemes, Wadham said, was the assumption that water could be poured onto many different types of soil without causing the most serious damage. Uh, irrigation is not an engineering problem, rather a problem for a soil chemist and a soil physicist. If they are satisfied, that a given soil will stand irrigation without deterioration, an engineer may then be called in. Installing the pipes is just a final operation after the scientific evidence for the task has been amassed. The Commonwealth Office of War Organisation and Industry, which is a terrible mouthful, so I'll call it WOI from here on, was the production executive of the wartime cabinet. That's how they call them. They describe themselves. WI, WOI believed in science, and it was they who reprinted Wadham's pamphlet in the 1940s as part of its food <coughs> security program. The WOI handbook acknowledges the importance of new knowledge for unforeseen circumstances of war. It devoted several pages to science and learning for the war effort, including a comment particularly interesting to those of us in the humanities in the 21st century that there is, I quote them, scarcely any university subject for which a war need has not appeared. WOI set up a scientific liaison bureau not to do science, but rather to coordinate talent to tackle emerging problems. The parallels with the 21st century global organisations like the IPCC are evident. Synthesis and integration are the urgent needs, not new knowledge as such. Soil collapse, erosion and gullying were international issues and they were importantly shared problems with the USA at that time. Stuart Chase's 1936 book, Rich Land, Poor Land, was passed around WOI in, in 1943. One of the many ways the US presence in the Coral Sea battle shaped the Australian government's priorities in this era. Rich Land, Poor Land opens with the story of an old Nebraska farmer sitting on his porch staring intently at the dust storm. I'm sorry, I can't do a Nebraska accent, so you'll just have to have it in Australian English. Uh, so this is what he said. I was counting the, the, the Kansas farms as they go by. It's tragic that we should sit on our porches while this great and good continent goes out from under us. When it's gone, in the sense of a hospitable environment, where shall we live? Paul Sears' book, Deserts on the March, uh, was influential in creating the Soil Conservation Service in 1935 in the USA, and similar soil science government authorities in New South Wales in 1938 and Victoria in 1940. Perhaps its greatest significance was in international advocacy in the 1949 edition of an ecologist for every rural community to support local soil conservation. Ecology 
was the science of prophecy and its holism was good, it's essential to good local land management. In Victoria, holistic knowledge was also important, but we tended to call it soil science rather than ecology at that stage. The long 30s drought contributed to the severity of the massive 1939 Black Friday bushfires, where most of the state burned and 71 people died. By comparison, the terrible Black Summer fires of 2019-2020 burned a much greater area, but only 33 people died. Black and ash went west with the wind. New Zealand first encountered red soil on the Queenstown ski slopes in the 3030s, but by the end of that decade, the stains were black, ash and burnt debris from the Victorian fires. Royal Commissioner Judge Leonard Stretton, who reviewed the 39 fires and in 46 the practice of forest grazing, called for more integration of conservation initiatives. Soil, water and forests depended on each other, he argued. They were an inseparable trinity. The inseparable trinity motto was adopted by the private conservation group the Save the Forests campaign, now called the Natural Resources Conservation League. Soil was important to the nation, to society, and to the use of science in making society a better place in these post-war years. It's not surprising that pedologist Gordon Hallsworth from the University of Sydney was chair of the international aspects of science at the ASW conference mentioned before. He later joined CSIRO and also became Australia's chief scientific liaison officer in London and Washington and in London. Through, through the 50s, 60s and 70s, these, these people, the scientific liaison officers in London and Washington, assisted travelling Australian, Australian scientists to meet contacts in the UK, in the Europe and the USA, and were very much partners with the diplomatic missions in these places. Soil science, or pedology as he liked to call it, was one of the key connecting sciences. Entomology was another, both ecological and interdisciplinary in methods. Soil conservation was a heroic operation, occupation for wartime and in post-war years when food security met internationalism. These are the sort of diagrams that come out of the WAI handbook. The rational machinery of government craved evidence and order and chose its leaders from the ranks of soil scientists. The architects of the United Nations, established in 1945, conceived the whole world as a village, a single community. They argued that wars occurred when there was a lack of consciousness in the minds of individuals that they were related to a world community. The UN defined itself in terms of a global public of world citizens. Historian Perrin Selsa has argued that in their quest for a world community, the United Nations ended up crusading for Spaceship Earth, an interdependent planetary system that required, to function optionally, the secure hand of expert guided state planning. The post-war cosmopolitan scientists and international civic, civil servants, the experts who served the UN, were leaders of the new world citizens. Their allegiances were no longer personal or national, but global. Imperial expansion through taking over lands for cropping was a pattern older than the Roman Empire. It accelerated again in the 20th century. Feeding people or governing against hunger is a fundamental business of tribes, nations, and increasingly of global organisations. Walter Clay Loudermilk, that's really his name, of the US Soil Conservation Service in 1939 declared what he called an 11th commandment. Thou shalt safeguard thy fields from soil erosion. Loudermilk was a controversial and enthusiastic supporter of Zionist agricultural ventures in Palestine and chaired UNESCO's Arab Lands Programme an initiative of India and Israel in the late 40s that later came to include Australia. Latimer's proselytising created some of the conditions that enabled big agriculture to become central to a bold global plan for a peaceful future. Soil, sol soil scientists were its foot soldiers. UNESCO's Arid Lands Project focused on desertification or anthropogenic deserts. It set out to restore water and nutrients to soil damaged by overuse and war. The idea of feeding the world became central to international initiatives, including the 1958 UNESCO Food for Peace Plan, 
and for its 1960 meeting, the International Congress of Soil Science chose for its theme, Alleviate Hunger, Promote Peace Through Soil Science. Practical projects demonstrated the value of expert guidance and international science. The concepts of the environment and the global community co-evolved in this period. By 1962, interdisciplinary science scientists working together in practical natural resource management started calling themselves environmental scientists. Not before that, really quite recently. As international air travel became more affordable, soil scientists increasingly influenced each other and began scaling up their expertise. By comparing and contrasting on a planetary scale, their expertise became widely known well beyond their national borders. Integrating more points of view produced more useful knowledge and new communities of knowers, knowers, hard to say, a parent Selson's words. National and racial inclusivity rather than exclusivity became a mark of credibility. So action research, the process of producing knowledge, was an act of social reform, of community development. But the downside of con concentrating on the people and the politics was that it downplayed natural scales. The universal principle that lands everywhere behaved in similar ways was essential for the efficient working of international development programs, but it totally disregarded the nat natural geography of watersheds and the quirky variability of arid lands. Nowhere was this more apparent than in the FAO soil map of the world, a grand project uh, developed by UNESCO and the Food and Agriculture Organization in 1961. Celsa likens it to a real version of Jorge Luis Borges' fantasy of an empire so defined by cartography that its geographers construct an unconscionable map the size of the empire itself. It was certainly not efficient or rational, though it aspired to both. In fact, the scale of this map, one to five million, would never convey the nuance and diversity of soils that might sustain a human or ecological community. The paradox was that the ecological principles behind Julian Huxley's original manifesto for UNESCO were sacrificed. The foul soil map functions as a risk management device, an agricultural weapon in a war against nature in a search for an abstract peace. The map asks simply what can be produced, under what conditions, and what interventions at what risk. It became a late colonial tool, a scientific basis for the transfer of environments. The soil scientists involved in the enterprise were global citizens who experimented in places unknown to science. They went into faraway places, worked with local people, then moved on to fresh fields once they'd established knowledge and skills, best practice and common international standards. While the locals mapped the soil, supplying the actual data for the soil map, the experts were in command of universal knowledge. Like United Nations aid workers, they travelled to hotspots rather than staying in a single place. They served the higher ideals of world peace and by the 1960s were part of decolonisation. The soil map came out just as Algeria left France and decolonising was Decolonisation was moving through the rest of Africa, much of Asia and the Pacific. It also came at a time when science for the environment was the basis of a new international patriotism of sorts. Soil scientists were sent to hardship postings to train locals in developing nations who lacked Western education. Yet the FAO soil scientists had their greatest influence in places like Australia, where the Western traditions of Commonwealth and state scientific agencies brokered universal universal knowledge for the local purposes. Jeff Downs, for example, had a stellar career in practical and theoretical soil and people management. I think Jeff Jack actually lost his head there. That's, that's bad luck, but maybe it's okay for the others. Um, in CSIR, in the Concert Soil Conservation Authority, in New Guinea and Papua during the war, and in international postings with FAO. His specialty was in aviation landing strips in remote areas. Australian soil conservation became closely tied into international trends as soil scientists worked across agriculture, forestry and water management. They also worked quietly behind the scenes in local land management, brokering between traditional opponents like the forest commissions and departments of agriculture through developing shared scientific management strategies. 
Downs was a leader in practical wartime soil work, but in the post-war years, he became a manager of people in global programs for FAO and UNESCO in dryland places, including Israel, Iran, Algeria, Morocco, and Brazil. In Australia after 1950, the new Soil Conservation Authority of Victoria, where he was a foundational force. So I've got a, a slide of this. You don't need to read it in detail, but I've just tied together the changes in the way Victoria's conservation efforts were regulated, something that was admired beyond Victoria. In the 80s and 90s, 1980s and 90s, Victoria's Land Conservation Council was chosen as a model for interdepartmental inter negotiations by the Queensland Government, for example. Some private conservation initiatives also adopted elements of its structure, and soil was the common denominator in government and community conservation initiatives from 1940 until 1997. But the idea of community environmental responsibility grew to take its place, beginning with land care in 1982 led by Victorian agricultural scientist Bob Edgar, who was also president of the Weed Society of Victoria. Land became scaled to regional and community groups, while the state government turned to neglected marine and offshore issues and also to cities and peri-urban spread. Soil conservation and agricultural practices affect ocean and estuarine fisheries, oyster farms and urban waste management too. But the complexity of 21st century environmental issues shifted the keystone role away from soil from around about the mid-90s. And we see the word environment appearing more and less soil in the organisational titles. Frank Gibbons arrived from Durham, England into Australia in 1947, just 23 years old. He came as a right-hand man or Sydney University soil scientist Gordon Hallsworth. who would also come from Northern England to Australia. Hallsworth, he chaired that international panel at the AASW and we've met him a couple of times. Initially, Gibbons worked with the New South Wales State Agriculture Department on improving the wheat grown on country with now exhausted soils. He mapped the soil of successful wheat farms in pedons Fowl's fundamental unit for the natural taxonomy of soils and advise, advised accordingly. Gibbons met Jeff Downs at a national conference of soil scientists in Brisbane in 1951, where Downs was recruiting for the new Soil Conservation Authority of Victoria. Gibbons was appointed research scientist, working at the SCA for over three decades, from 1953 to 1984. His work was to undertake practical land system surveys analysing the soil types of various regions of Victoria, seeking out their suitability for cropping, water catchments and for forestry. He drew on international best practice, methods developed by CS Christian of the Land Systems Division of CSRO in the Northern Territory, methods also adopted by FAO soil mappers. As a first world nation with an undeveloped tropical north, Australia was uniquely positioned to survey, survey its terra nullius in ways understood by national science, international science. Yet even in places like Victoria, where Western style agriculture and pastoralism have a long history, there was still no central planning office for cropping and erosion control until this time. The survey project begun by the Soil Conservation Authority in the 1950s was later continued in new directions by the Land Conservation Council from the 70s. What constituted conservation changed during Gibbon's long career in soil science? In retirement, it turned personal. He found himself on the other side of big state development. He joined the Franklin River campaign in Tasmania, rafting in the 1980s with many much younger campaigners to save this wild river from a hydroelectricity scheme. No longer a man of universal science, he was awed by the old growth forest, the smell of earth untroubled by the plough, and the rush of an undammed river. The other protesters were half his age or less. I don't want to get myself arrested to be a silly old man going to jail with protesters, he said. And he caught their fervent personal passion for the place itself. As the tall trees and swirling waters rushed by, Frank Gibbons felt he really belonged to the wilds of Tasmania's southwest. I felt that if I were to die there, that I would find peace, he said. Gibbons needed space, air, and perhaps a purpose beyond the economy. He found peace not in rational agriculture, 
but rather in wild nature. For Franklin's importance was as a wild river. Being part of that protest gave Gibbons a chance to reflect on how nature itself functioned and supported people. In the interview I had with him in 1991, when he knew he was terminally ill, he wanted to tell me for the sake of posterity that this was what conservation was all about. Letting go of control is not part of Western wisdom. It's certainly not seeing like a state, to use James Scott's term. Scott's work in, examines forestry, food production, and measuring up nature for the purposes of the state in colonised places in East Asia. His subtitle is How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed. Hard to see on that slide. The book explores forensically the limits of big picture vision tensions between science for feeding the world and the pushback for decolonisation by local peoples who know and understand their place have dogged United Nations agricultural projects throughout their history. While those with Western wisdom and good intentions at the top hope that education and know-how will trickle down and benefit all, the people on the ground who knew their soils and their place in fine detail always knew more. And their knowledge worked on incommensurate scales. Interdisciplinarity doesn't mean one size fits all. It means choosing who to listen to and at what scale. As the Anthropocene advances, concerns about carbon emissions, land clearing, methane emissions, cows, soil carbon, land degradation, wildfires, deliberate and accidental, all converge. How we can grow our food is as important as the crops we sow. Companion planting, mosaic landscapes and diversity, including biodiversity patches on our cropping land, are all of a piece. Charles Massey's very personal book, The Call of the Reed Warbler, is a call for diversity and local solutions, sensitivity to local soils, making agricultural changes that are good for people, for communities, for wildlife. And it's not just the farmers that have to do this, but also the next step up. We need to buy at farmers markets, buying small quantities fresh, looking for the local. These are all important steps to avoiding waste and bad food, as well as giving food growers, rather than their financial markets and shareholders, a fair return. While the digital revolution has offered a capacity to scale up what we know into ever more planetary models, we may lose a capacity to find heaven in a grain of sand. We see the patterns of numbers squeezed into models based on what we can count. But we're still learning that people on the ground everywhere don't understand how they fit into the global experts' universal schemes. Frank Gibbons died over 25 years ago. Yet the Food and Agricultural Organisation is still today working on pro projects to feed the world. Spatial modelling and remote sensing images are still the technologies of integration. In 2014, I heard Professor Wolfram Mauser from the Catholic University in Munich speak about global food futures. His team was developing a map to decide where on the planet you could grow crops, specifically soybeans, the most efficient plant-based protein to feed the world's exploding population. Environmentalism will be about information sovereignty, he declared. This may seem confusing to an audience for whom environmentalism is about saving cute furry animals, but in Germany, issues like nuclear power, chemicals and GMOs are also baked into environmentalism. The knowledge revolution that informed Mauser enabled him to see the planet from outer space, revealing deforestation and urbanisation, the widespread Anthropocene changes and the very limited places that are not affected by the activities of our species. Yet the view from space is still blind to history, to local knowledge and to human scale sense of place. Its ecological thinking is lost in scale. Every monocultural revolution, wool, wheat, soybeans, has reaped a whirlwind of problems in the health of the land, the people and the planet. To me, what was striking was how little land was left on the planet for this sort of cropping mega project. 20% of the new lands Mauser identified as available for cropping in the world were in Australia's north, about a third of our continent. As it happens, C.S. Christian in 1947 could show through his on the ground land system surveys 
Our grand schemes to open up the north to agriculture will always fail. There is simply not enough soil and not enough water. The top end is fissured, stony and given to erosion. There is no place to terrace and build up soil and there's only one river in the Northern Territory that, that has a spring. All the rest fail for at least six months of the year. The land is only available to cropping if one takes one's view from space and superimposes an assumption of regular European seasons. Traditional owners manage the land well, but not for cropping. From space, the land appears empty, an opportunity for growing food. It's still defined as empty because of a lack of agriculture. Does this sound familiar? I put up my hand and asked Professor Mauser what to do with what I know about this particular land from its history and ecology. He was surprised by my, the detail of my line of questioning. His answers were big scale, model driven, and missed the point. He passed on quickly to the next question. Yet his own unconscious frame of ref reference appeared clearly in the choice of his final image, a slide of his local bucolic Bavarian green landscape with cows. His pictures told me he was remaking the world with his own place, rather than considering the ecological limits of his models in places he didn't know. He was a good green defender of the planet against evil GMOs in his own mind. The domination of the planet by knowledge and information was a good thing. Sustainable agriculture is undoubtedly a better option than ignorance and wastefulness. But large scale modeling needs ground truthing and an awareness that waste is a cultural concept. Where the cosmopolitan information nomad comes to ground is actually part of his knowledge system, not something apart from his expertise. I use the masculine pronoun advisedly. Where is home? What soil do you know? These are questions to ask our agricultural revolutionaries, but this informs what counts as knowledge and what does not. There comes a point when they have to ask this question of themselves as well, at the point of their lives when they stop being experts and go home. Fred Gibbons surprised himself with his epiphany in southwest Tasmania. A deep cultural knowledge of country is something truly remarkable, and this is what Indigenous Australians offer. Traditional knowledge adds to the diversity of wisdom, and this is especially important when it challenges the default scales of Western science. I want to finish the lecture where I began and reconsider Ding Dyson and the influence of the fledgling department of HPS. HPS offered interdisciplinarity in a curriculum that was otherwise narrowing and professionalising. Interdisciplinary thinking was also fostered by the post-war mix of university students with returned soldiers and others coming to university in mature age. These students craved a space for eclectic knowing outside silos. They're still the people who have a capacity to understand both the data generated by conventional science and the social implications of that data. Mid-career people are very strongly represented in the environmental studies courses where much of my work has been done in Australia and also in Sweden and Germany. Interdisciplinary thinking requires both nuanced understanding of data and evidence and a sense of its applications for society. The history of climate change science, for example, requires more than an understanding of how to analyse gases trapped in ice cores, although that skill was part of what Wally Brooker needed to alert the world to global warming in 1987. Brooker, in his important paper in Nature, Unpleasant Surprises in the Greenhouse, not only analysed the bubbles in an ice core, he also showed their social importance. Brooker added the urgency of surprise in the paper's title, and the metaphor of the greenhouse has echoed down more than three decades of climate writings. Historian Tom Griffiths was more poetic, calling them the sacred scrolls of our age. If you drill into an ice cap two kilometres thick, Griffiths said, you can extract a core that's layered year by year, a precious archive of deep time. In our present vexed times, when science and policy making diverge more than ever, and the predicament of the Anthropocene is all around, there are growing calls for transcending disciplinary Western thinking. Elgin Nowotny makes a case for finding ways to value collaboration, synthesis, and integration above originality through new research funding models that are better geared towards policy outcomes. He argues that arcane solo science, the work of scientific heroes of yesteryear, is not the only game in town. 
hit the cr criteria for most research funding, particularly here in Australia with our limited ARC and HMMRC models, still overwhelmingly fa favours arcane dis disciplinary knowledge that fits FOR codes. In Sweden, there is a recognition that university-based research, that is publish publications in disciplinary journals that enhance the status of universities on international leagues tables, is becoming increasingly distinct from the sorts of research needed for wicked problems like climate change, growing social inequality and mass extinctions. The Swedes create different grants programs to support policy making. We in Australia have excellent technical knowledge of such phenomena but poor public access to this research and limited social license to endorse its recommendations. As polymath historian of science, Sverker Sunin has commented, human suffering is not caused by lack of gadgets. It's caused by dysfunctional social institutions. If research insights are reduced to factoids for scholarly counting devices, they will never find their way into adding value to society that supports that research. Novel interconnections between disciplinary insights and practical wisdom will be lost or worse, or worse, they'll be captured by vested interests. Celine argues that in a time when innovation and competitiveness is simply measured in numbers and the paradigm of performance management is failing, it's essential to find new ways to support research that creates quality evidence for governments and society, advice that helps human and planetary health thrive together. Without research-based insights, especially those that draw on creative work, including non-Western initiatives, the humanities in its broadest sense, together with the natural and social sciences, you need all those sorts of knowledges to make policies that will alleviate human suffering. Ing Dyson herself held the view that science was something over and above the sum of the separate sciences. She resisted a synthesis that focused on a narrow method that favoured the natural philosophy and intended to exclude the sciences she knew best, biochemistry and physiology. She favoured an HPS course design that enabled a diverse set of teachers to work together, to use each other's expertise and that respected the strengths and aspirations of the researchers themselves. The question of professional training in HPS was a conundrum. It was the original multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary interdisciplinary area, she called it. To possess scientific knowledge is not a sufficient condition for the production of worthwhile history or philosophy of science. Ping solution was a mix of compulsory and non-compulsory subjects, chosen with guidance that combined in a flexible degree to suit the ultimate research direction of each individual student. She resisted a singular scientific method. This was one of the gifts she gave the HPS discipline in Australia. She brought with her world-mindedness, a willingness to look around for other ways of shaping a teaching and research school for arts, science and medical students, and had elements of models from USA, England, Scotland and further afield, but remained pragmatic, pragmatic and Australian in, scar in style. She had an intuitive sense of the classic ski and tia, knowledge that is also wisdom, interconnected, not isolated factoids, such as might be dredged from Wikipedia. In the 21st century, disciplinary scholarly knowledge is no longer enough. We need to stop being reasonable. And in philosopher Eleanor Gordon Smith's turn of phrase, reason doesn't overpower greed, alas, nor it seems does it persuade. We are in, at the end of the tether of evidence-based policy making and reasonable democracy, just of the Anthropocene. The planetary is too big to be comprehended holistically. So we have only the local to build up a compost of deep understandings in which to grow new ways to live in times of accelerating change. Paying closer attention to local soil is a start. More than disciplines, we need ways of knowing with our hearts, our creative instincts as much as with our heads, and a fully imagined audience, to use Judith Brett's insightful phrase. That fully imagined audience needs to imagine people who don't read scholarly journals. Maybe they won't read at all. Art, music, film and dance are also knowledges. The History of Science, Technology and Environment Division at the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, is pushing HPS into experimental spaces through its philanthropically funded KTH Environmental Humanity Lab, whose t-shirts proclaim, we will not be disciplined. The lab advocates a whole body approach to knowledge, 
Taste concepts, it urges. The taste of soil in the air is a powerful reminder of the urgency of transcending disciplinary understandings of the world. In the words of Amitav Ghosh, if it's true that a picture is worth a thousand words, then what is the power of the billions of images that now permeate every corner of the globe? Scholars can't ignore the visual, the tactile, the auditory, the olfactory. Marcia Macmillan of Mullingudgery, Western New South Wales, won first prize in an international landscape photo competition with an instinctive a snap from her iPhone. She's a teacher, not a photographer. After years of drought, the family were experiencing four or five major dust storms every week in 2019. As the horizon darkened, Marcia went out to ensure the animals were fed and safe from a terrifying wind. Her nine-year-old daughter helped her out. It stopped on the way to play dare with the red storm cloud monster. First she ran towards the mountain of soil, then back to her mother. This photo, Marcia said, captured the moment when something so innocent, small and fragile was taking on something so powerful and just completely out of control. This is the image. There's a fearlessness in Whimsical Warrior. The little girl taunts a future where humanity, indeed all life, has no certainty, no control. Macmillan's daughter, like Greta Thunberg, is brave and open. She dares. She's a warrior, a new sort in her boots and fairy skirt. The vulnerability adds to the seriousness of the image. She implicitly asks, are you ignoring the soil in the air, the soil of my future? Facing the future is something adults don't do very well, yet this small child could show us a way. Sometimes one image can stand out and speak for our times. Musical warrior did just that. Thank you. Hi, I think we just lost sound outside. Um... Outside Melbourne Uni. I can't hear you, John. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Very faint. Are you able to turn up the volume a bit? Thank you, Libby. Now, I'm not sure how I can run this remotely, seeing that I cannot see anybody inside the room and I can't also can't see anyone within the chat function. So I think I'm going to have to hand it over to uh, somebody in the room with you, Libby. You're going to take questions. So much <laughs> massive feedback. I'm gonna try again. I think that you you guys are gonna to have to handle any questions or discussion because I don't think I can do it remotely from where I am. Thank you. Someone in the room has a question. <laughs> can, can you hear me, Adam? Because I can't yeah. hear you. Yeah, I can hear you okay. Um, is there a quick, can we get a question from the floor of some sort? <laughs> you seem to be advocating science on... So this is Rod Holm, and I'll give him the, the microphone. <laughs> You seem to be advocating science on a small and a local scale. Do I understand you correctly? Um, how does one bring that together with science on a larger scale? That is exactly the conundrum. How do you scale up and scale down and use the right scale for the right problem? Um, I think that's the, uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Rod. It's a, I, I don't think I've got all the answers, but it's, I've been sitting in lockdown in um, COVID for the last... Um, I've had, we've had a lot of lockdown here in Victoria. Um, and during that time, I've been thinking about how, how other crises have, have been playing out. And each of them, there's, there's a sort of what's happening at the national level or the international level, but there's also how people are coping with lockdown individually. So the sort of issues of, of how, how are you going, um, stay safe, you know, there's these sort of little messages people send to each other, that's the, that's the personal end. And it doesn't mean that we don't need the vaccines too. Of course we need the vaccines. But we need to be able to scale up and scale down and we need um, to have this, the science well coordinated uh, and the politics is probably the, the least helpful thing so that the scale of the national is actually not necessarily the one that helps individuals stuck in lockdown and uh, nor does it help the scientists finish their um, testing of the, the vaccines. So that would be that would be my answer for all sorts of scientists. But, but but the idea that big science is the only science, I think, is what I'm getting at. And uh, the, the keynote before this about Maori internet um, knowledge in astronomy was absolutely fascinating. And I think that Pauline Harris gave us all sorts of other ways of thinking about knowledge. And what we really need is tools for accommodating Maori knowledge, Western knowledge, very local places, very international places, but we can't have a, a plan to feed the world by looking from outer space and deciding this place is empty and let's dump the, let's dump the crops here if, if there's no soil and there's no water. I mean, that's basic stuff. And I think that the, the prestige always goes to the global and the generally the, the global is often, um, the, the gender is often, uh, the local is, is more female and that means that it tends to be quieter in the in the discussions. So we've got some questions in the in the chat that I could see. I mean, can I just open up the chat? Uh, I don't think there's any questions that's being opened. Okay. I'm like, I can't see the discussion, so I can't comment on it. So that's. <laughs> John Wilkins has raised his hand. Thank you. Um, hi. <laughs> um, some years ago, I was um, looking at uh, soil classification schemes around the world. And um, while in Europe they were largely conventional because there's no undisturbed soil to speak of there, uh, the Russians, for example, had a very um, sort of causal approach to soil classification. Australia's was basically predicated around what you could grow or graze. It was a, an entirely, um, well, I have to say venal approach to soil classification. I'm wondering if you can comment on that because uh, it seems to me um, that um, a lot of people have... Um, talked about Australian science, but, you know, it's always been science in the sense of economically important, it seems to me. We don't seem to have a tradition of blue sky research. We don't seem to have a tradition of, um, um, for example, um, conservation biology for the sake of conservation biology. It tends to be the fur and feathers effect that you mentioned earlier on, the charismatic animals. So would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I missed a little bit, bit at the beginning, but I, the Ukrainian soil scientists certainly were very influential on the uh, patterns of soil science in the United States. So there was a lot of exchange there. Uh, and so the, I think that soil science, our style was, came from Ukraine to the United States, Australia, Came later to it, but it's not to be forgotten that there are an extraordinary number of Australians actually in places like South. So that the uh, Director General might come from somewhere and that the Deputy might come from Australia. 
And that happened a lot of times throughout this, this period that I'm talking about. In terms of blue sky science, I think we have done all right to blue sky science. I think we haven't done so well in the last 30 years. But the, um, it, you know, Andrew Blaker's work on, on solar panels is, is absolutely at the front of, of the world. And he had to get the Chinese to develop it because nobody would develop it here. Um, so the energy transitions, I can certainly, I know something about because I've been working with some people in that space. We, we have the, we've got the blue sky science, all right. It's just we have no connection between that and the, and the development for use. And then we have on the other side, the concern that the economy's going, you know, it's, it doesn't want to spend money on science. Well, actually, they've spent the money on the science, they just have failed with the last little bit, or they've failed to introduce um, industries that would want to use that science. We've got a question from Adam Lucas. Um, Libby, how do you see alternative agricultural techniques like perennial polyculture farming, subsurface drip irrigation, and permaculture in contributing to sustainable agriculture in Australia and globally? I think they're all really important, and I think um, the uh, the uh, some of them work in. They all come from different places. You've got to do the right thing in your place. Not you. You can't have. Um, we can't crop in in uh, area near Alice Springs very easily because they're just in the right thing. So you, you have to look at, at places. But I think that when people talk about intensification, they often mean doing things the same way everywhere, where in fact intensification is, is precisely the opposite, where you, you can do a lot more with a lot less if you do it the right way. Um, Charles Massey's book that I mentioned, uh, the Call of the Reed Warbler, he's looking at doing cropping and conservation together. And that's really interesting because he's been reseeding. He's actually put less of his property into cropping and more into conservation. He's getting a higher return on the, the, the lesser amount of land. So that's another form of intensification and that's certainly more sustainable. And he's actually working with the local Aboriginal people that, are the traditional owners of his land. So that's a really fascinating story. Uh, question from Matt Kearns. Um, I'm interested in the proliferation of popular soil conservation efforts in this period and their reception by more recognised forms of scientific conservation. I'm thinking here of the reception of Lyon Mitchell's Soil and Civilization, which just was derived as non-scientific, for example. A similar pattern is evident around regenerative agriculture in recent years, where mainstream soil science is oriented primarily, primarily towards questions of yield um, regeneration in fallow land by virtue of its capacity to achieve negative emissions outcomes. But wider notions of soil health and soil care remain outside the forms of valuation that characterise contemporary agronomy. Thanks very much, Matthew. I thought your session this morning on uh, the 1970s and the um, the workshop that followed it was very interesting and in a sense my talk is a prequel to your session. Um, Aline Mitchell's um, Soil and Civilization is really interesting because the trope of that book about the sort of the history of agriculture as a, a civilising project is exactly the same trope used by Paul Sears and the American is much better known than the Australian of course most people will know Aline Mitchell as the uh, writer of the Silver Brumby books, not um, as somebody who write, wrote about nation. But she was the farmer when, while her husband was away at war and she was concerned about the Alps which were eroding. So she had a real place she was writing about and she was quite specific about ways to do things about it, but she buried it under a sort of global history that I think perhaps didn't help with her case. Are there any more questions uh, people want to um, put into chat or Q&A facility? Well, I guess all except the New Zealanders are getting hungry. <laughs> um, question from uh, Rachel Ankeny, uh, slightly left of centre, but I wonder if this background might help us better understand the relative lack of attention to native grasses and other indigenous foods. 
Yes, the, the, the grasslands are the, the least protected biome in Australia, um, and that's something that really we've only started saying in the 21st century. We weren't saying that earlier. We were trying to replace the uh, native grasslands, particularly with, and the Soil Conservation Authority was big on replacing them with ryegrass because it, it stopped erosion. And so um, the uh, farmer who I, whose records I've been reading in the State Library uh, sent ryegrass up to Mount Buller to save the ski slopes there in, in the 50s and 60s from his property in Western Victoria. So I think that the ryegrass era was, was coming out of the, the uh, Arid Lands project from UNESCO. They, they, that's how they restored the, the, the um, Palestine and um, India. They were the, the big projects with sowing things that would keep the soil from blowing away for a start. But if you don't let the other things grow back and let alone consider yams as, as agriculture, which is a whole new, whole new uh, way of thinking about things. Um, yeah, we, we, are, we definitely are neglecting our, our, our grasslands. And I think we've got to start thinking about um, biomes that, that specialise in grasslands. And I know there's a, a proposal for an international biosphere reserve for the basalt plains of Western Victoria uh, right now that people are working on it and it's a great idea because that's the natural vegetation there is grassland. Thistles. They would they came they came the weed society would have some views on that. <laughs> Ross, he, he, he's talking about thistles as being the natural uh, it, it certainly there are a lot of thistles there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if there is uh, no further questions coming through in the chat, I might uh, use this opportunity to just, um, we do have something to present to Libby for, um, thank, in thanks of a wonderful Dyson lecture, so. <laughs> thank you. We're sharing a very small microphone. <laughs> oh, that looks great. <laughs> we have a uh, bottle of biodynamic wine and so that uh, Libby doesn't just drink it and then throw it out and forget about us. There's a set of coasters uh, to oh. go with it as well. <laughs> and now I will mute our microphone here and throw over to Adam to uh, um, conclude. Thank you, Ruby. And thank you, everybody, for attending. I know it's been a long day for everybody. So your stamina is admirable. And um, we are resuming, I believe, at is it 9 o'clock or 9.30 tomorrow morning, Martin? <laughs> okay. 9.15 it is. Well, good night, everybody. Have a pleasant evening and uh, see you tomorrow. Well done.